Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I think I know all of you who are on here tonight, just in case. I'm Marcy Stagner, and I'm the Program Director of Arts and Culture at the Memphis Jewish Community Center. And welcome to this installment of Lit Fest Live in Your Living Room. Tonight, I'm excited to talk with Ben Sheehan, who is the former award-winning executive producer at Funny or Die. Ben's new book is called OMG, WTF, Does the Constitution Actually Say? And um, his mission to, well, I'll get back to this in a minute, but his mission to increase voter participation began in 2016, where he used digital videos to help register 50,000 new voters. In 2018, he founded OMG, WTF, which of course are our swing states, Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida to teach voters about executive races during the midterm elections. In his new book, OMG, WTF, Does the Constitution Actually Say? A Non-Boring Guide to How Our Democracy is Supposed to Work. He has annotated the entire constitution from its preamble through the amendments, explaining the document's provisions, pointing out its loopholes and giving readers everything they need to know to become informed, effective voters. Super important right now. Um, before we begin, I just wanna direct everyone's attention to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your questions there and um, we will get to those as well. So thank you so much for being with us. Let me put this, change the spotlight. There we go. Okay, that's how we do this, right? All right, so Ben, um, just to start, you may, you take the constitution, which um, happens to be a pretty dry document and you managed to make it funny and digestible. Um, why did you decide to write this book and what inspired you to do it? Sure, so I grew up in Washington, DC and I went to school in DC. And I had parents who worked in government both with and for the federal government. And I remember when I was about five or six years old and I was at the dinner table and my mom took a pen and a napkin and she drew two houses. And in one house, she wrote the number 100 and in the other house, she wrote the number 435. And that was my first civics lesson over, over dinner. And I only got between kindergarten and 12th grade, one year of, of government or civics education formally in school. In, in, um, and, and that's not uh, unique to my school. That's the case with a lot of schools. In fact, today, only eight states require a year of civics at some point between kindergarten and first grade. So we are barely teaching people how the government works and then they are going off um, and are voting age and are able to participate in it, but they don't understand it. it. Like basic things like the difference between the Senate and the House, what are the branches of government? And I saw this firsthand with my work in 2018 and I started this organization called OMGWTF, which stood for Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida during the 2018 election specifically. And we focused on governors, secretaries of state and attorneys general. And we'd have these events and people would come up to me before the speaking portion and would ask me questions about Jeff Sessions or Rex Tillerson. And that's when I realized they, were, they thought that I was talking about the US Secretary of State or the US Attorney General. In fact, they didn't even know that their state had a Attorney General uh, or Secretary of State at the state level. So that kind of combined made me realize that we're kind of in the moment um, where we're realizing we have a real civic education crisis in this country. And so I thought I would use my background sort of studying government my entire life, in addition to growing up in the, you know, in and around government, my background at Funny or Die um, in the comedy space and kind of fuse them to make our founding document a little less uh, uh, inaccessible. Um, and you absolutely do that. There are parts in your book where I'm laughing. It's very informative. I got an education. So many things that I thought I knew that I um, had misconceptions about that I didn't even realize were misconceptions. And you brought up a point that was actually coming later in my questions, but I'm going to just flip it around because um, you talk about civic education in schools and really how it's lacking. And what I'm wondering is there seems to be a even for, even in the little amount of civic education that does exist, there seems to be a disconnect between what we learn in school and how we understand 
how this, you know, how civics, how government, how, how politics affects us in our real life. Like it's not just some hypothetical or lofty entity that doesn't affect us directly. So can you talk a little bit about maybe what you do to educate first time voters? Um, because one, because civics education in schools is not being taught to the degree that it used to be. And then also, you know, how can we kind of bridge that disconnect between this education and this faraway thing that doesn't seem to affect us when we're learning about it and actually turning that into action um, with our votes because we do understand how that affects our communities. Sure, so I think one big place to start is by learning what the jobs actually do. And when we're paying attention to campaigns or we're in sort of the political cycle, the election cycle, we focus so much on the candidates. We focus so much on the contest between the candidates. We focus on the political parties and, and you know who, which one is winning or which one is more of a chance of winning. Um, we spend a lot less time talking about what the actual power of the office is. And I think it's really important when we have conversations about civics education to connect the dots between the job and the issues that people care about. And in many situations, or I guess many issues, the jobs aren't necessarily federal level jobs. They can be state and local jobs that have the most power over things we care about. So one example is climate change. Sure, Congress can pass laws around uh, the climate, but our governor can uh, uh, sign bills proposed by the legislature to uh, combat climate change at the state level. Our mayors can take action. Um, when it comes to uh, gun laws, you know, our state legislatures can pass laws uh, around uh, around guns. For you know, the state of Florida specifically, I found out from the um, March from Our Lives, March for Our Lives uh, kids that weirdly the agricultural commissioner has a huge amount of power on the flow of guns around the state in Florida. So if you care about that issue, you should know who that person is. And police reform, um, you know, our, our sheriffs and district attorneys are, are elected at the county level. So it's really, I think, important to connect the dots between the jobs and not spend so much time on like which parties are running, um, which candidates are running, but also like really focus on the actual power and sort of the, the tools at, at the disposal of the person holding that office. Thank you. Um, so speaking of power, can you talk a little bit about, so we, we've, of course, we have a, an election coming up. Election day is November 3rd. Early voting has started in, in most places. Memphis, we know it's already started. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, there's been some talk about a possible lack of peaceful transfer of power. Like, is that, what is our constitution, what does our constitution have to say about, about that? And um, what is the timeline you know, look ahead look like? Sure. So the Constitution doesn't specifically say anything about a peaceful transfer of power, but the whole thing is kind of predicated on the fact that there will be a peaceful transfer of power. So the way that it works sort of after election day in terms of how the Electoral College will play out, there are a few really important dates. I don't know if anyone has their Google Calendar open, but it might be a good time to write these down, uh, add these dates. So obviously November 3rd is, is election day, but really the end of the election, because right now with early voting is in 35 of 50 states. So in 70% of the country, you're already, we're already voting. So the election's happening. Um, between November 3rd and December 8th, is a really important window to pay attention to. So this is the moment, sort of the, the time frame where states finalize their electors. And what I mean by that is that they have time to finish the vote count. They have time to, you know, if there are disputes around the vote count, if there are, um, you know, a, a recount is necessitated. If there's a, a controversy that has to be settled in courts, it's got to happen before December 8th. If it does happen before December 8th, um, states can actually choose a new way to appoint the electors. And they could theoretically do something different from the popular vote. Now, it depends on the state's own laws. But the ultimate power in the Constitution with how electors are, are appointed is with state legislatures. And so what theoretically could happen, again, depends on each state's constitution and, and state laws, um, is that there could be this controversy. And then the legislators could say, you know what? Um, the vote in the state is tainted by uh, mail by vote by mail fraud, and um, we can't trust the uh, the the count. There are you know illegal uh, immigrants voting, and we're going to have the duly elected members of the state legislature uh, vote for uh, to choose the electors. 
And under the Constitution, they have that, that power. So it'll be really important to see what each state does between November 3rd and December 8th. But if there is going to be something different from the popular vote, that has to be acted upon by December 8th. December 14th is the next date. So this is the actual date of the electoral votes. In the, uh, in, in, per federal law, the electoral vote happens on the uh, first Monday after the second Wednesday in December because Congress is ex extremely weird and didn't want to give specific dates. So on December 14th in every state, the electors are going to actually cast electoral votes and they're going to vote, you know, each elector will vote for president and also separately for vice president. And then they will transmit those votes. They'll be certified, um, you know, by the um, by the executive in the state, and then sent to D.C. And then on January sixth, um, in uh, Congress, the vice president, who's also the Senate president, is going to count the electoral votes. And if somebody gets a majority of votes for president, they become the president. If somebody gets a majority of votes for vice president, they become the vice president. But what's interesting to keep in mind is that this is happening in front of the new Congress. So the new representatives and the new senators will have been seated 72 hours before this, this count. Um, so they'll be the ones who will be watching this. But if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes for president, so if there's a tie or someone just gets a plurality and not a majority, then the House decides the president. And how this works is that each state, not each representative, gets a vote. So California gets one and Tennessee gets one and Texas gets one and so on and so forth. And you need a majority of states, so full majority, 26, to win. Um, for vice president, if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, then the Senate picks the vice president. And how they do that is each senator gets a vote. So you need 51 uh, to become the, become the vice president. If for whatever reason, a president and a vice president have not been chosen by January 20th, this is the final date on everyone's Google calendar, um, then the line of succession kicks in for president. And per federal law, Congress has established the line of succession as the speaker of the house. Uh, then if the speaker can't do it or hasn't been chosen by that time, the Senate, the Senate president pro tempore, uh, if that person can't do it, then you have the, the heads of every uh, executive department um, in the cabinet from the oldest to the newest. So the oldest is Secretary of State and the, and the newest is Homeland Security. So you've got about 17 people uh, in line to be president uh, or at least act as president if neither a president nor a vice president are chosen by January 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. I'm hoping we will have answers before January 20th. I share that hope with you. Yeah. So I'm going to take it back um, to your book a little bit, to the Constitution, and ask you, what is something that you think most people don't know about the Constitution that you think that they should know about the Constitution? I would say a pretty big one is that we don't fundamentally have the right to vote. And what I mean by that is it is up to each state to decide who can and can't vote. So let's look at the three branches of government to start, right? We don't vote at all in, in uh, choosing judges, right? It's, it's nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate at the, the federal level. So um, we vote directly for our senators. We didn't used to. It's only been about 107 years that we voted directly for senators. Our state legislatures used to choose them directly for you know over the first 100 years of the country. Um, so we don't choose judges directly. We don't choose the president directly because we have the electoral college um, that I, I, I spoke about uh, just before this. And then when it comes to members of Congress, again, senators used to be chosen by state legislatures. And so people could only vote directly for their members of the House back when the Constitution was written. And they could only do that if their state let them vote for members of the state house. And each state had different qualifications of who could vote. And some states allowed a lot more people to vote. I mean, New Jersey for the first 20 years or so of the country allowed women to vote. Uh, several states allowed free African-Americans to, to vote. And sometimes this came with property ownership requirements. Um, but some states didn't let, you know, restricted it to uh, property owning white men. And what's really important to understand is that in order to get all enough states to ratify the constitution, because you need nine of the 13 that existed at the time, uh, they didn't say specifically who could and couldn't vote because they were worried that it would make some states not go along with the constitution. So they left it up to the states. So it doesn't specifically say in our constitution who can vote or who can't vote. 
And what's really interesting is we think about these incredible voting rights amendments, right? I mean, the, the 15th Amendment, which um, you know, protects voting rights for um, African Americans and, and former slaves. The 19th Amendment, protecting voting rights for, for, for people on the basis of sex. The 26th Amendment, protecting voting rights for people who were 18 and over. But it didn't actually give these people voting rights. It just said, if you are a woman, if you are an African American, if you're 18 and plus, and you're a citizen, you can't have your right to vote taken away because you're black, because you're a woman, because you're 18 now. So it didn't proactively give people the right to vote. So it's really largely up to our states to decide who can and can't vote in the state. And we see this today at the different laws around, you know, who can vote if you have a felony on your record. Uh, on the extreme end, Iowa, Virginia, and Kentucky um, ban felons from voting for life. Doesn't matter what category of a felony, if you have a felony on your record, you can't vote. The governor can give those rights back to you on an individual basis, um, but you lose your right to vote for life. In Maine and Vermont, even while you're sitting in prison, you can vote. So we see this play out today in, in sort of different ways. And even at the local level, my home state of Maryland, in local governments, in at least five cities, 16-year-olds can vote for their mayor and their city council and their school board. So we, we think that the Constitution specifically says who can and can't vote. It doesn't, it leaves it up to the states. And so there was an amendment introduced recently that allow, that, that would give people a proactive right to vote. It was introduced maybe two months ago by uh, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. And who knows what will happen with that. The amendment process is very, uh, uh, it's hard to amend the constitution, but I think the concept of voting and what the constitution says about who can and can't voting, we have totally misinterpreted uh, for a very long time. So when do you think that shift in thinking started? When when did we start? I mean, at some point people knew that about the constitution. I mean, when do you think people started thinking that their right to vote was, you know, in that was part of it was written into the constitution? Well, I think you have with the 15th amendment, it, it changed so many things. I mean, you know, there was a 60 plus year gap between the 12th Amendment and the 13th Amendment and the three Reconstruction Amendments in the wake of the Civil War, uh, the 13th abolishing slavery except as punishment for a crime, the 14th Amendment, which has birthright citizenship, it has equal protection of the laws, um, and it also has a penalty for states who disenfranchise voters. It doesn't specifically say men of color, but it says if a state doesn't let a man who's a citizen and resident of the state 21 and up vote, they get penalized and they meant people of color. Um, and then the 15th Amendment saying you can't deny a citizen's right to vote on the basis of, you know, race uh, or, you know, color previous condition of servitude. And the language is very similar, you know, the voting rights can't be denied or abridged and same with the 19th and same with the 26th. And so I think maybe it was just an easier way of explaining it. And after 1924, or sorry, 1926, when Arkansas became the last state to ban uh, non-citizens from voting uh, in elections, before 1926, non-citizens in some states could vote for president, they could vote for their governor, they could vote for local races. So we sort of just since then have, have equated citizenship with voting rights. Uh, when it wasn't always the case. And today, like with 16 year old, 16 year olds, some local governments in Maryland, local governments in California allow non-citizens to vote from races for school board, for their, for their mayor, for the city council. So I think it's, we've, through so the last hundred years, we've equated citizenship with voting rights, um, but it's actually not a requirement in the constitution. So interesting. Um, so this leads me to thinking about voter suppression. Um, we hear all about it. We hear, you know, we know it's happening all over right now. And can you talk a little bit about what voter suppression looks like, what it can look like? Because I think it shows up in really like not obvious ways. And um, what do you think our founding father fathers would have to say about it? So voter suppression is as old as the country itself. In fact, you can look at voter suppression through the amendments and almost see a timeline. And if you take away the Bill of Rights for a moment uh, and look at the 17 other amendments that are, were added to the constitution, about a third of them have to do with, with voting, expanding voting rights. And again, it goes back to the fact that in the constitution it doesn't say who can and can't vote. And so really where voter suppression has, has existed uh, and flourished is at the state level. 
And sometimes that was overt. I mean, sometimes it was, you know, violence that was used to, used to intimidate voters. In the wake of the Civil War, um, after, um, you know, African Americans could now vote, especially in the wake of the, um, uh, the, the 15th Amendment in 1870, uh, you had a massive amount of violence at, at polling places, really for decades after. And today we see less of that, but we've gone from, you know, the, the old ways of poll taxes and literacy tests and whites only primaries. And by the way, literacy tests, it, it, some of them required you to memorize the constitution, you know, word by word. Uh, some of these weren't even literacy tests. It was guessing the amount of jelly beans in a jar or the bubbles in a bar of soap. I mean, it had literally nothing to do with literacy tests because they were designed specifically to prevent certain people from voting. So that's sort of the old method of voter suppression. And then in 1965, Voting Rights Act, uh, the year after the Civil Rights Act ended all, all of that, basically. And for the next five years, that was expanded and implemented. And so, you know, really since 1970, 1975, I guess, was, was also an amendment to the Voting Rights Act. But you haven't seen voter suppression like you used to before, the, before Jim Crow. But that all changed in 2013 when the Supreme Court struck down part of the Voting Rights Act. And, and the part that they struck down said, if you are uh, a state that has a history of discrimination um, and was included in the Voting Rights Act or the amendments to it, uh, you got to get permission from the federal government if you're going to change your voting laws because you could, you know, do something that disenfranchises voters of color or some other group. And what happened is the logic being, well, 48 years ago, you know, we decided these were racist states and so we don't need uh, them to get permission anymore. And literally hours after the decision came down and that protection was removed, you saw states starting to pass new voting laws, law, vote, voting, uh, laws around voter ID, laws around um, uh, striking people from the voting rolls, uh, things like exact match, things like, you know, use it or lose it, where you send a postcard to somebody and if they don't return it in a soon enough amount of time, they lose their right to vote. There's no other right in the constitution where we send a postcard and make people return it to keep that right. So we sort of have seen this administrative approach to, to voter suppression. And it takes the form of like, you know, complicated rules and, and, and how you mail ballots in and, and even looking at people's signatures. I mean, that's a way to, to, to throw out ballots and absentee ballots is to look at a signature on the back of the ballot, look at a signature on someone's file, their driver's license and the state registry or their um, social security card and being like, that eh, doesn't match. These aren't forensics experts who are doing this. These are like volunteer poll workers or people hired by the, the state government. So it really takes on this administrative uh, bent. And I think it's really important to, to keep in mind that even if it sounds common sense, like, yeah, photo ID, like, why not? I mean, they, these are all things that have been tested over and over to really see if they disenfranchise voters of color, poor voters, uh, low income voters, um, young voters, and it is a suppression tactic. So what can people do about it? What, what, can, what can people do? Um, yeah, what can people do about it? So a couple of things. Uh, in the most immediate way, you can help people stay in line at the polls. So one thing that is a, a suppression tactic are long lines at the, at, at the polling places. I mean, in Georgia, uh, earlier last week, you saw 11 hour lines yeah. of people yeah. waiting. That's not an accident. Even if you have high turnout, it's 11 hours is insane. Um, so what you can do is you can help people stay in line. You can bring them water, you can bring them food, you can bring them uh, snacks. I did this in 2018 in Georgia and people were there, you know, waiting until the polls closed with their kids. Their kids were hungry. They thought they may have to leave the line and go feed them. Or some people work night shifts and they would have to leave the line, even if they were there and in line to vote, if they weren't at the voting booths by 9 p.m., they'd have to leave and go to their night shifts. So um, bringing food and, and sustenance to people waiting in line so that people, if they're able to wait longer, can wait longer. That's an, that's an easy thing people can do immediately. Uh, another one is know who controls the elections in your county and your state. So know who your state legislators are. Uh, you can go to openstates.org and look up, plug in your address. It tells you who your state representatives and state senators are. These are the people who make laws around voting in your state. Um, if you are in one of the states that has the state secretary of state as the chief elections 
officer. Uh, make sure you know who that person is. If you can vote for them, make sure you know the next time they're up for election that you're electing somebody who's going to approach voting fairly in a in a fair-minded way. Um, and I would say start with those three, something you can do immediately, and then things you can do in terms of educating yourself about who controls the elections in um, your state. And even people like the county clerk, you know, sometimes those are elected uh, positions. So knowing who these state and local leaders are who control your elections um, is a good way to attack it long term. I think it's really important, you know, for all of us to get involved in our local governments and, and to know, you know, not just vote every four years, but, you know, look at, you know, what's happening every two years, look at, you know, what happening directly in your community and, and not just the community where your own house is, but in the zip codes surrounding your house as well. And, um, you know, look at, you know, voting lines and are they changing? And, um, you know, if you had to, I'm going to get into the Q&A in just a minute. So everyone, we're talking about Ben Sheehan's new book, OMG, WTF, Does the Constitution Actually Say? A Non-Boring Guide to How Our Democracy is Supposed to Work. You can get it locally at Novel. They're carrying it for us. And um, of course, you can also get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble too. Um, so throw your questions into the Q&A at the bottom. And while y'all are doing that, if you had to, um, if there was, if you had to pick, you know, what you think is the most important part of the Constitution, what would you say? Wow, that's a great question. Um, the most important part of the Constitution, I would say, in terms of moving the Constitution toward a more equitable document, I would say the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And those came all during the five years after the end of the Civil War during Reconstruction. And they fundamentally changed the Constitution in, in many ways. And it still has a ways to go in terms of making you know, things more equitable for, for people in terms of specifically protecting certain rights rather than leaving it up to the states or having sort of vague language. But I would say the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, were greatly expanded um, uh, accessibility and, and uh, to the ballot and equal rights for, for many people who didn't have it previously. Great, thank you. All right, I think we have a question in the chat from Anna. She says, uh, let's see, will we talk about Supreme Court nomination and the concept of court packing? Can we even put more than nine justices on the, on the Supreme Court? I missed it at the very beginning. If I missed it, you didn't miss it, Anna. We didn't talk about that. So can you talk about um, the concept of court packing, Supreme Court nomination? Can we even put more than nine justices on the Supreme Court? Uh, I will answer those in reverse order. Uh, okay. Yes, we can put uh, more than nine justices on the Supreme Court. It would involve Congress passing a law uh, to change the number of justices. And when the Constitution took effect in 1789, we started with six Supreme Court justices, and then it went down to five, and then it went up to seven, and then it went up to nine, and then it went up to 10, and then back down to nine. And ever since 1869, we've had nine justices on the court. So Congress can change this as it did many times in the first hundred years of, of our country with a, with a law. And when we talk about the word packing, I'm not a huge fan of the word court packing because I think it, it kind of, um, it confuses the idea of, of, of doing something deceptive with something that is more in line with how the court was designed to function. So when we talk about court packing, I use the term balancing. I think that it, it gets more at what the idea of the legislative or the judicial branch in the beginning was meant to do. And justices are the only people, um, as well as other you know, federal judges, are the only people who serve for life um, in our government. And why do they serve for life? Why are these people unelected? And why are they you know, serving for a, a, during good behavior? So they could quit, they could die, obviously. They could be impeached and removed. Other than that, they're there forever. So why don't we elect these officers? The reason is because the people who wrote the constitution wanted the, the judicial branch to be the most balanced part of the government. And why? Because they're the ones that are interpreting what the constitution means, saying what it means and saying what federal laws mean. 
So they're the ones who decide how the constitution functions as interpreted um, for generations. And so the idea behind lifetime appointments is that you weren't having justices who were beholden to partisan interests or political parties or the, the whims and sort of the fads of the, the moment, the factions of the moment. And we're really looking long-term ahead at what's best for the country and, 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 what, is, and what the law actually says in keeping with the, um, the spirit of the document. So when, by, by that logic, um, you would want a balanced court. You don't want a court that's leaning to the left. You don't want a court that's leaning to the right. You want a court that it has, you know, a, a wide variety of perspectives so that you're going to have the healthiest um, interpretation of the constitution. So when I look at a court, whatever side it's leaning to, I think, you know, if you wanted to appoint more people, you'd have to, again, Congress would have to change it. Um, but I think of it more as balancing the court to do its intended function um, rather than something like, you know, nefarious, uh, which is what the word con packing con uh, connotates. Sure, absolutely. All right, other questions coming in. Um, while they're coming in, I'll ask another one of mine. So can you talk a little bit about your work in um, educating first-time voters? What do you do to educate first-time voters? Sure. So I started doing voter education in 2016, really, and making videos um, that were kind of offbeat and, and weird and, and comedic and that were directly tar intended to register voters. So we, we focused on states where voter registration can be done online. And so there was a direct link from the video to register to vote and we would track people who, who voted. And, and the organization I worked for, we got about 50,000 young voters to, to register to vote just off of videos going viral. Um, but in 2018, I was far more focused on the education part of it, specific to governors, secretaries of state and attorneys general. And the reason being is that in 2018, there was so much talk about the House, there was so much talk about the Senate, but you had the vast majority of governors, secretaries of state and attorneys general up for election. In fact, over 70% of those offices across the country and with the exception of maybe a couple of gubernatorial races, they weren't getting a lot of attention. And so why should you care who your governor is and your state secretary of state is? What can that person do? And so we focused on issues like um, uh, climate change. One thing your attorney general can do is they can sue companies that pollute in your state, whether they are you know, polluting your water or polluting your air or not following environmental laws. Um, they can hold those, those organizations accountable. Um, so, and then with gerrymandering, uh, in most states, the governor has the ability to veto lines that are drawn by the state legislature if they're unfair. So for anyone unfamiliar, um, every 10 years we have the census, uh, it just ended. Uh, so it, hopefully you filled that out so that your state can get more um, representatives in the house and more federal money. But we use the census and then we redraw the district lines for the US house and for our state house and our state legislature um, and local offices too. But what can happen is that if you are in a state where the legislature draws the lines, they can draw their own districts. And so they can make it so that they continue to win their elections by making their elections uncompetitive. So one thing that we use to educate voters about the issue of gerrymandering is uh, my organization um, created a line of jewelry where every necklace and pin is shaped like one of the worst gerrymandered congressional districts in the United States. It's called Gerrymander Jewelry. It's still up. You can go to gerrymanderjewelry.com and, and order a pin or a necklace. Um, and we did this very real seeming jewelry commercial talking about um, packing and cracking and, and gerrymandering. But we did this sort of weird entry into gerrymandering to teach people what it is in sort of a, a slightly askew way. Um, and so now what I'm doing is focusing on this cycle is talking about how what's going on right now ties back to the Constitution, because I really believe at the end of the day, not getting civics education um, is a tool of voter suppression. Because if you don't teach people how the country works and why they should care, then they're not going to turn out to vote because they don't know what power they have. So expanding information about not just the ballot, but the jobs and how government works, I think creates participants both in the short term and the long term. So this is, this is a question that I have. It's not, you know, I just thought of it. I, so I used to be a teacher and I know because I used to be a teacher that, um, and depending, I've taught in two different States, um, depending on what state you're in, 
depending on what kind of a school you're in, you have a very prescribed curriculum, like a very prescribed set of things that you have to teach. And with um, when I stopped teaching, Common Core was like kind of on its way out. There, unfortunately, leaves little time. I mean, people are hammering home literacy and math, and you've got to be on grade level by third grade, or you're never going to catch up. And unfortunately, the things that get, you know, dropped or pushed to the side are things like history or, you know, social studies or science and, and um, you know, these other class, civics, you know, these other, these other classes, because literacy and math become the focus with these, um, you know, educational platforms that are, you know, come around every few years that really don't make a huge difference. So, you know, what, how, do you think that there is a connection? Is there any intentionality behind these um, education reforms and um, the lack of civics education? This is something I think about all the time. And this is, this is, this is my, my realm of like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if I was gonna call myself a conspiracy theorist in some way, I feel like I'm constantly searching for that moment where like some powers that be decided not teaching the government to people helped preserve their, their own power and their seats. Um, I honestly believe that the policies of the last 18 years aren't specifically a, a referendum, like, like aren't specifically targeting the exclusion of civics education because like you mentioned, they target so many other subjects too. And this started with No Child Left Behind in 2002, continued with Common Core in 2010, continued with Every Student Succeeds in 2015, which is an update of uh, No Child Left Behind. But the common through line, as you point out, is English language arts and math. And it's, you know, we test schools and um, we can, you know, use that data to either improve schools or like, you know, compare ourselves to Norway and math and like bragging rights. Um, we also give funding out to schools based on their performance. So schools that are failing in these subjects could be shut down by their state. So you have teachers, as you well know, who are just like pressured to teach these subjects and to, and to standardize tests and they don't have room to, to fit this in. And so I do think that these policies are well intended to make students better at these subjects, but I think they're so open-minded or, or narrow-minded. And the fact that it's persisted for 18 years is, is insane to me. Um, and I do think that there may have been a moment coming out of the 50s and 60s uh, where I can trace the sort of beginning of a decline in civics education because in the 50s and 60s, coming out of the uh, of the war, there was this huge moment of, of patriotism and, and service and duty of the country. And so civics education, government education was everywhere in our schools. I mean, you had like four courses. You had civics, you had American government, you had US history, you had foundations of democracy. These were all common required school uh, courses in our schools. Compare that to today where only eight states require a minimum year of, of civics or government. And what happened during the 50s or really the 1960s. You had you know, at least a decade of strong civics education. You saw the Civil Rights Movement. You saw the Civil Rights Act. You saw the Voting Rights Act. You saw the Vietnam War protests. You saw it leading to the, 20, the 26th Amendment, uh, protecting voting rights for uh, people 18 and up. So I believe that these movements, these, the anti-war and the, and, the, and the Civil Rights Movement happened in large part because we had a really civically educated population and it led to tangible results. So one way, if you don't want citizens to put pressure on you if you're in government to you know, change things, um, one way to stop it at the root is teach them, not teach them how they do that, that it can even be a tool to better their lives. Um, so I do think, I haven't found like a smoking gun in the wake of the 50s and 60s, but I do think, think there's something there. Um, but I do think the last 18 years, it, you know, it, it's at least started out as a well-intentioned um, policy with sort of accidental consequences. But at this point, 18 years in, the fact that we still haven't found a way to require this, you know, multiple years in every state, it's starting to get a little suspicious. I, I would agree. <laughs> All right, Aaron is asking which states are the most at risk for constitutional injustices slash voter suppression? Um, well, around voter suppression, I think you have to look to, to states that have really sort of outsized um, uh, uh, policies that, that make it harder to vote. Um, one example is Texas. Texas has 
Um, you can't vote absentee without an excuse. So you have to get a doctor's letter. If, you, if you're under 65 and you're not physically out of the state or you, are not, uh, you don't have a, a disability that, that prevents you from going to a polling place, um, you have to get a doctor's letter to be able to vote absentee. But if you're over 65, you can. Um, Texas is also one of the states that doesn't let you use COVID-19 as an excuse. It's one of five states. Um, Texas doesn't have online voter registration. So you look to states where it's hard to register to vote, where it's, um, they have strict laws about voting absentee, where they have strict laws about um, uh, a vote by mail, and you know, strict laws around voter ID. So I would say, you know, it's a lot of Southern states, but it's not just Southern states. Wisconsin has, uh, uh, you know, really strict voter um, ID laws. Um, you know, there were counties in Arizona that were added uh, to the list of states that had to get permission from the federal government to change their voting laws. So it's not confined to the, the I mean, it, it largely began in the South, but it's certainly not confined to the, to the South. So because voting is so run at the state level, you know, things like voter ID, things like the policies I mentioned earlier, um, you know, making it harder for people to turn out to vote, to cast ballots, those are the ones that are really targets for voter suppression. As, as far as constitutional injustices, it really depends what you're talking about um, outside of, of voting. Because um, you know, some some states. I mean, look at felony disenfranchisement. You know, again, the seeds of felony disenfranchisement are actually in the Fourteenth Amendment. It says that states will be punished if they don't let twenty-one and up dudes uh, vote, and except for if they committed a a, a crime. So. I guess this is a way of saying that some of the things that we may find in just today actually have their roots in the constitution, like prison, uh, um, like prison labor. I mean, there are at least three states. Uh, and again, Texas is one of them. I believe Georgia is one, and I believe Alabama is one that pay zero dollars whatsoever for prison labor. Um, some states pay, you know, a few pennies on the dollar, but those states pay nothing. So, I guess the sad reality is. The answer to your question is a lot. Um, I mean, we could go on to you know issues like uh, abortion rights. Um, you know, with um, the new makeup of the court, um, Roe versus Wade in 1973 and uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in uh, 1992 established a constitutional right to an abortion under the 14th Amendment, primarily a little bit under the Ninth Amendment. But if that if the new court hears an abortion case and and decides that you know what, we're revising it. There isn't a constitutional right to an abortion. Um, it becomes, you know, unprotected federally overnight. And then it depends on what, you know, which, which states will continue to allow it. So, um, you know, the, the, the answer to your question, the first half of your question is it really depends on the issue you're, you're talking about. Thank you. If anybody has any, any more questions, please put them down in the Q and A. Um, if there was one last thought you wanted to leave us with, um, about your book before, you know, during election season, what would that be? Well, I have read this document, this constitution more times than I ever honestly thought I would. And I have learned that the power where, where I thought the power lays in our government is not where it actually is. And we have long taught that we have three co-equal branches of government, right? With checks and balances, the legislative, the executive, and judicial. Half of that's true. We have, well, two thirds of it are true. We have three branches of government and there are checks and balances. They are not co-equal in any way. Congress is clearly the driver of our government. And you can look at the constitution. It is the first article. It has 10 sections, the most by far. In fact, in the original, like handwriting of the constitution, it took up four pieces of parchment. Fully the, four, the first two of them are all about Congress. And then articles two through, through seven are crammed into the final two pieces. So Congress is clearly the most powerful branch of government. And I think we have a tendency to think about the president a lot and to think about the courts, but it's really the legislature. And it's because the legislature are our representatives. You know, when the founders were writing this document, they didn't want something like England where you had one person who had absolute power passing it down by bloodline. So they created a system where representatives are elected, you know, sometimes more democratically than others, but the power rests with the people and with, with Congress and the representatives. And you see that as a through line 
through the other levels of government. Same thing at our state legislatures are so powerful. State legislatures are all over the constitution. Um, our, our city councils, our county councils, it's really in almost every case, the legislative branch that is the driver of our government. And I think it's really important for people to reframe their thinking about government with that as the engine. And off of that, I would recommend that everyone learn the names of, you know, at least five people in their lives. Um, they should know who their two U.S. senators are. Uh, they should know who your, um, your one U.S. representative is. And you should know who your state senator and your state representative are. And sometimes if you live in a multi-member district state, you could have a couple of different um, uh, representatives at the state level. But knowing who your state legislators are and your federal legislators um, is super, super important because those are, you know, according to the founding document, the most powerful people in our government. We do give a lot of power to, you know, to the president, to the executive branch. Um, at what point did that, and I know I said that was going to be my last question, but at what point did that, did that shift? So the one place where the president, because in the constitution, there, it's not a lot of, like there is barely any unilateral power in the constitution for the president. The only unilateral things the president can do are basically pardon um, federal crimes other than impeachment, uh, grant reprieves, uh, reprieves so lessen punishments. Um, you know, the president can call an emergency meeting of, of, of Congress uh, or one of the branches. If they can't agree on when to adjourn, the president can do that. But other than that, almost everything the president does in, uh, requires the consent of Congress or, or, or just the Senate. Um, so it really is kind of like the, the president works for Congress in a way. Um, where it does get murky and vague is where the president is the commander in chief. So when you get to situations that kind of veer into defense, you know, it doesn't specify what that role means. It's the commander in chief of the U.S. Army, the Navy, and the, uh, you know, the U.S. militia, which is now the National Guard and, and Reserves when called into service. So certain things can be, you know, funneled under defense. And so as the commander in chief, they have the power to do this, this, and this. So it's sort of this vague area that unlocks potentially power because it's not specified. Um, but I really do think you've seen the expansion of executive power. I see someone talking about executive um, uh, privilege um, in, you know, either during a war or during a national crisis. I mean, look at the Great, uh, the Great Depression. Uh, you saw a massive expansion of the federal government because we had a massive crisis at hand. Uh, during wartime, same thing. You saw uh, you know, expansion of, of, um, of executive power to, to, deal with a, to deal with a crisis. We haven't always shrunk the federal government back down after we deal with that crisis, so it stays rather large. Um, it's been growing exponentially. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in many ways, and, and even talking about things like, you know, you know, executive orders aren't in the Constitution, you're not, that executive order just means you're enforcing an existing law, or you're doing something to help enforce an existing law. It's not a law itself. So because of so much inaction in Congress, it's been used as a way to circumvent Congress, and Congress isn't really doing anything and not getting a lot done. Um, it's sort of a way to, you know, irrigate legislation around, around, around Congress. So I do think it's something we have to keep an eye on because it really is antithetical to our founding document and everything that the constitution was created in opposition to in, in England. Um, and, you know, national crises are some of the places you see the roots of this great expansion. All right. Well, Ben, thank you so much for being with me, being here with me tonight um, and for answering all of our questions. Let's see. I think that should cover just about everything. Um, if you, again, you can get the book at Novel, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate you and we're excited about your book. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm actually gonna chat my email here. I don't know if that went to everybody, um, but uh, uh, if anyone didn't ask a question or had a question that we didn't get to, feel free to drop me an email. I'm happy to, happy to answer and, and you know, thanks again. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. We'll see y'all soon. Great. Thank you. Take care.